uh, making it to SG Innovate despite uh, the rain earlier. Thankfully, it seems like it's uh, diminished a bit and allowed everyone to be here, and thank you for that. For those that have been at SG Innovate before, uh, I hope that you know our goal for these types of sessions is to encourage discussion, debate, uh, to share perspectives and opinions. We don't try to take a position that this is the right answer or not. We simply say let's share information and ideas because our goal is the more people that are involved, the more we can try and do what we really aspire to do, and that's to build important companies from Singapore that go on and meet needs in many different markets around the world. And as part of that, we must work together with leading organizations, leading governments, and so in this particular session today, uh, I'm very thankful to be working together with uh, Denmark, with Team Denmark, and so in this particular case, even more fortunate to have the Ambassador of Denmark to Singapore who will be sharing her thoughts with us, and then that will get us started, and then I have the easy bit, which is to help sort of moderate the panel of people that have some experience in this field. I'm going to make one request, and that is your engagement because we have Slido for those that don't like to do the Ambassador of Denmark to Singapore. Please, Dorothy, join me. Thanks, Steve. It's always such a great pleasure to be here at SG Innovate. It's one of my absolute favorite things because we have a real conversation here and we try and create an impact. So thank you very much for the invitation. Dear panelists, also great to see you, Kenneth, Nidhi, Freddie, and Steen. I look forward to hearing your important input later on. And dear friends of SG Innovate, dear friends of Denmark, I hope we can have a great discussion today uh, and that you will really participate actively. Now, why did we suggest to Steve that we take up maritime innovation in this format? Well, that's because we are sensing that something is happening in this industry. I have been following it, uh, the maritime industry closely since around 2014, I guess, when I became uh, the director of Invest in Denmark back home in, in Copenhagen. Back then, anything the industry talked about was how to bounce back from the, uh, the global financial crisis that hit us all and knocked us to our knees in 2008. That was the only topic of conversation, how to bounce back. We talked about the slow pickup in global growth. We talked about the overcapacity in number of vessels and how terrible that was and state aid, but there was very little uh, thinking on how to completely disrupt and change this industry. When you have a focus on, on just surviving economic uh, bad situation, then you focus on improving the margins. It's all about uh, getting that 3% uh, at the bottom line and cutting cost and size is everything. Having big vessels and, uh, and, and, and moving in that direction. That's what it's all about. The, the old timers in the industry who had followed them much longer than I had back then, they always talked about this entrepreneurial spirit that was the hallmark of the maritime sector. And frankly, for a newcomer like me, I couldn't really see it. It, I, I couldn't see it. I can now, but I couldn't then. I thought it was uh, very much a spreadsheet business. I hope you don't mind me saying so. But now the reason why I see it moving away from the spreadsheets and into a different mindset is because there are other pressures bearing down on this industry that are important and that are now becoming really manifest and impossible to avoid. The first one is the new global demands to cut sulfur emissions and eventually to cut greenhouse gas emissions. I think the industry has realized that this won't go away and now we have to think about how to solve it. That is starting for real now. The other one is new players that can potentially disrupt the business. There's been a lot of talk about whether shipping will have its Amazon moment and, and so on. And there are a lot of players in the industry that say that can't happen because we own these big ships. There's no sort of excess capacity along with private people that you can use for this. But I don't know. There can be some disruption for sure. The third pressure bearing down on the industry now is new technologies like automation, augmented reality innovation, if you can expect other uh, companies to be forced to do the same thing. Otherwise, it will be a race to the bottom. So Singapore and Denmark have a strong interest in having a good international uh, collaboration on these matters. We work together in the IMO, 
and um, part of our focus now is to make sure that the enforcement regulations will also be there. That we don't just, for instance, have a sulfur cap and uh, limit the amount of sulfur that uh, the vessels can burn, but that we also follow up and have a regime for what we do if, uh, if the, the companies don't follow these. The third thing we can do as governments is that, and that's the reason why we're here, Steve, in case you're wondering, is that we can help support new partnerships. I think that a lot of focus has been in both countries on trying to support startups uh, and thinking that the solution is in having a startup ecosystem. That is also important, but more importantly, we have to work with the established industry partners on understanding the challenges that they have and help them innovate. Sometimes this requires uh, collaborating with a startup, other times it requires building a startup, and sometimes it's an in-house uh, innovation process we need to go through. But these kind of uh, collaborations, I think governments have a role in, in supporting. Singapore and Denmark have already done a lot to try and connect uh, the dots on these things. The first thing we did uh, shortly after I arrived in Singapore was to sign an agreement on e-certificates together with the, the, our Norwegian partners. We are the first three countries who now recognize e-certificates uh, in shipping, and we are trying to get other countries to, to move along. This is a small thing, but can potentially become important. We took the next step last year when we linked up our two innovation, maritime innovation ecosystems. Here in Singapore, you have Pier 47, no, Pier 71, and in Denmark, we have Pier 47. I think we had ours first, but never mind. Uh, and linking both these two peers is the Danish company Rainmaking uh, that play a role in, in developing uh, innovation in both our countries. I think this would be an important bridge to try and leverage and cross-fertilize uh, our two ecosystems. So we have done a lot, but there's more that can be done, and the next step has to be done by you guys. You have to tell us how we can work together. It's up to you to tell us how we can solve these challenges and how you can still make money while doing so. Uh, enter the, uh, the game too late, and it's going to be costly. Come in too early, there's a risk of failure. Many startups fail early. So I hope we can uh, get into that during this discussion today. At least I saw uh, during the Singapore Maritime Week just a couple of weeks ago that uh, 2,000 leaders in the maritime industry were asked which was the most important hub for talent in the maritime sector. And 60% of them pointed to either Denmark or Singapore. So we have the talent, we have the raw ingredients here. Now the question is whether we can work together also with other industries to uh, unlock the potential. Whoops. I have to pick up my paper because I have some questions I want to ask you at the end. The three questions I thought about that I hope I'll get an answer to today, maybe not, but I hope so, is can government do more to help build partnerships between new and old players? What do you want from us? And are you open to collaborating with companies from completely different fields and share more knowledge and have a more open source approach to development? I think that has been the Achilles heel of the maritime sector in the past. And lastly, how quickly do we need to act? Is this hype, or how fast will this go? I look forward to the debate. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you so much, Ambassador. And uh, what a great way for us to get started. So we try to keep things fairly simple and casual. And you can see, by the way, that I'm normally dressed. I'm the least well-dressed person amongst all the panelists, but we're just trying to be uh, easy going. So what I'm going to do now is call the panelists up without title, without introduction, because I'll give each of them a chance to articulate in their own words. So in no particular order, can I ask Steen and Freddie and Nidhi and Kenneth to join me, and we will get uh, things going. And please help. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. Please help me make sure that we circle back to the questions uh, that the ambassador uh, posed, because it's. Always a good idea to make sure that if an ambassador says, these are very important questions to me, uh, we need to make sure that we do our best to tackle those as well as questions that you have in your mind. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go down the line here, and then we'll do things in a more random way. But I never like to read bios and intros. I think they're very formal and often uh, too long. So what I'll do is ask each person 
describe who you are, what you're doing, and whatever your own words are, in part so that the audience knows how to engage with you based on your particular areas of passion or expertise. Uh, Kenneth, over to you. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kenneth, uh, CTO of MPA. And so maybe to ambassadors, a uh, great speech is about where the government can play uh, in terms of our role. Uh, so you heard from Ambassador about the ITM, which is the transformation map that we launched in 2018. Uh, so essentially, we believe that we have three broad strategies. First, for innovation, is about deepening the R&D capabilities, right? So you, you will hear that we set up centers of excellence in research in NTU, NUS, Singapore Police. These are helping us to build up longer-term capabilities. And then for the near to mid-term, you Second strategy is to nurture the tech ecosystem, which is where I think will be relevant to today's uh, conversation because we believe that the tech ecosystem is here to help the maritime companies. And what we will try to catalyze this part is by bringing the demand side into the equation. I remember when I met Steve and he said, well, are you going to are you going to buy, you know? So I say, no, I'm not going to buy, but I'm going to bring the companies who are going to buy the solution into the ecosystem. So this is where we form the circle of digital innovators from marine time companies in Singapore, growing from 23 companies last year to 46 this year, to come up with challenge statements. This challenge statement will be higher quality because we partner with uh, NUS Enterprise to sharpen all these challenge statements so they can be published to the startup and then they can respond. So last year's uh, uh, facts will be uh, the challenge statements, about 20 of them attracted 122 proposal and eventually 15 are being given a grant to build up the prototype and to test with the corporate uh, companies. So these are the this is the second strategy, and the third strategy is to put up a living lab. So Ambassador may have visited the MPA Innovation Lab together with PSA Living Lab, Jurong Port Living Lab, is to showcase the an experiment technology in real operation scenarios. So that's my opening uh, pitch. Yeah. Thank you, Nidhi. Um, thank you, Steve, for uh, for having me here. Um, my name is Nidhi, and um, I spent 10 years in a corporate environment working for a large logistics company. And after that, the startup bug bit me. So uh, I've been running a, a company podcast for the last one and a half years. What we do is we work for logistics and maritime companies, and we help make them more profitable uh, by predicting how cargo is moving across the world. And we use external data sets and machine learning to do this. Um, really excited to be here and share my views. Okay, thank you. Freddie? Yeah, I'm, I'm Freddie. Uh, I'm founder of Moscord. Um, Moscord, the short way to describe Moscord or explain Moscord is the maritime Amazon, which have been used a lot. Uh, to build a, an Amazon in this business here uh, is a lot of the things are the same as a, a normal Amazon, one can say, in the C2C world, but there's a lot of other services and functionalities and processes we have to implement. Uh, so that has been very exciting. We have about uh, 100,000 products on the platform today. We can deliver in Singapore, Rotterdam, now Houston, and we go to Alcasillas now. So it's all a global thing, and I think that's one of the topics here today. Then when you talk about marine maritime business, it's a global network, so we have to work together and cooperate. That's why we have this event here today, I think. But uh, yeah, a maritime uh, marketplace for ship supply. Ship supply is all products used for a ship in operation, from food to tools, uh, spare parts uh, of uh, different kinds, uh, paint, chemicals. It's like a little town out there. The uh, difficult thing is that the customer, they move all the time, uh, time. It's, it's quite annoying, but that's how it is. Uh, so I think that's a little introduction I can do about Moshcourt. Right. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Steen. I'll, I'll try to behave because as our ambassador was giving her speech, I was sitting looking up at the, uh, at the top of the board here and uh, 
I'd really like to be invited back. You've got a lot of cool things on your agenda. That's just a couple of days of agenda you have up there, and there's a lot of stuff that, that I'm certainly interested in, especially the AI part, I must say. Um, so I'm, I'm, my background is sort of a bit of raw jug of, of shipping in many ways. I've worked for a little more than 20 years uh, with uh, AP Model Maersk, or as you would know, the Maersk line in sort of the nuts and bolts of container shipping. Uh, then I spent eight years with a classification society. These are the people that are chiefly naval architects that uh, write the rules for how you are to build the ship and then uh, actively participate in, in the active life of the ship uh, after it's built as well. Um, and recently I had a couple of years where I was working with the navigation and communication uh, equipment that goes on board ships, so basically all the the electronics that you see on uh, on a ship, and particularly the, the bridge. Um, part of what I have spent a lot of my uh, my, my time on outside of corporate is uh, getting some startups uh, into Singapore and getting some of the startups that are in Singapore to uh, work together with corporates and finding some of these uh, models of, of solutions among others together with the with Kenneth and the MPA team um, to determine how can we actually uh, identify some of the problems that corporates have and how can we make uh, startups available to uh, co-create uh, together or co-create with, uh, with the startups and how do we get that whole thing moving forward. Um, and um, another part of, of, of my activity level is out of the Singapore Shipping Association, the SSA, uh, where I, I have a, a board duty there, and, and I serve also as the uh, as the chairman of our technical committee. Uh, there are 470 members in in Singapore of the SSA, and these are chiefly ship owners, ship managers, and pretty much everyone in the maritime industry, uh, also on the banking and insurance and all sorts of sites. So again, uh, an industry collaboration where we come together, and and my remit in there is is again uh, the digital journey of the shipping lines in in many uh, ways and. Maybe just to give a concrete example, if I may, then uh, we have made a joint industry program uh, between the SSA, uh, MPA, and NAMIC, so the, uh, the national association we have here in Singapore of uh, additive manufacturers, so 3D printers. Um, and, and we are working on a what I think is really ambitious program of, of trying to identify what can we print uh, rather than forge, if you think in terms of spare parts that need to go on board ships, how can we go through that whole journey of working with the original equipment makers, getting them to accept that they have to share their IP, all that intelligence that go into producing their, their spares that they can make a lot of money on, I'm sure, today, and how can we move that intelligence in at a digital platform onto printers and uh, cut that whole logistics chain away that you often see to supply spare parts to ships where you might have very few manufacturers that can that are licensed to print uh, to uh, manufacture the spare parts today but as the ships they trade globally it, it's in the interest of the ship operator to have instant access to spare parts and this is a multi-billion dollar industry so it's a it's one of these big hairy uh, tasks to to throw ourselves at so a very exciting digitalization journey we're going through there Okay, so a lot of things. Please make sure that uh, you are capturing whatever it is you want to talk about or shout a question. A couple of quick things. Uh, I guess the good news is, Nitty, that since it's about innovation, I've got a handful of questions already coming in, and all of them include you uh, or podcast. So we'll come back. I mean, we'll, we'll sort of bounce back and forth. But I want to start off with Kenneth asking a question just to frame the conversation. When we use words like innovation, I'll expose a bias because for me, innovation is a continuum. You'd have sort of invention, creativity, use word disruptive, big leap, unknown, one side. Then you have, we know what we're doing, we'd like to do it slightly better. I think the ambassador articulated a 3% improvement in, in the bottom line, which could be very meaningful for a major firm. Uh, could make the difference between profitability and, and non-profitability. So when we use expressions like innovation, and you're thinking about innovation, and we think about this continuum, untested, unproven, but could be unlocking something exciting, where do you think about this issue? When you think of it from MPA's perspective and the community that you work with, 
uh, because it means a lot of things to different people. So maybe we start a little bit by approaching what do we mean by this word, mm. innovation. Yeah. Okay, I think, uh, and even to different enterprise, maybe, okay, our appetite and our uh, goal is to encourage the enterprises to take the step towards innovation. So if they are looking at incremental innovation, we think that's great. But at the same time, there will be external pressure like Ambassador is talking about 2030, 2050, you've got all these new IMO requirement that comes down that people need to think a bit longer term. So then the next year, when they have solved uh, and gained and have the appetite for innovation, then you say, look, but this incremental innovation may not be sufficient. What about the next challenge statement that you're looking at? So I think it is a nurturing process that we want to help and to catalyze our maritime companies and having different programs from uh, longer term to mid term to immediately and even to have interns from uh, schools to immediately solve your incremental innovation problem is, some, is a goal that we want them uh, to embark on. Yeah. So you and I have worked together before, so I'm going to use something that we've talked about here before, which is mindset. Yes. So I think you're thinking, if I hear you correctly, you want to encourage the mindset of experimenting, exploring, trying, adopting, more so than just let's innovate on this problem. You want a continuous, ongoing culture of, right. of innovation that's as your highest ambition. Yes, and that's why I think the circle of innovators coming together, you know, when we came on board, we, we were like scratching our head, who do we talk to within a maritime enterprise to get them to start innovating, right? You can't be just talking to a CEO. The CEO needs to dedicate and commit a person, a team to look at how to innovate. And I think there is a good, I think the Marine Times still need a lot of uh, innovation support, but companies uh, are already starting to have their own innovation, right? The one, you got SCS, uh, Calixia, you have Gary here, who's already having an in-house acceleration. Capital is here, and they, they start to innovate within their enterprises. And for companies who, in the SME market, then of course with IMDA, we work to feed what the startup companies to have the solution to be now approved by IMDA, to be part of uh, the SME Go Digital program. Then SME can purchase them and get a subsidy. And that actually do a pipeline and a life cycle for our startup to go into scaling up and to provide solution for even the SME markets. So bridging off of what Kenneth just talked about, Nidhi, some of the questions here, and I'll put my own wrapper around this. Steen mentioned corporates and startups working together. You're building a company, and working with, with big companies is not an easy challenge for any startup. So perhaps can you share a little bit from the entrepreneur's perspective, how can any startup work, how can, <laughs> how, how can any startup work with big corporates and really be thinking about this idea of helping them with innovation? Because it's great for people to have the ambition to work with startups, but it's hard to actually adopt something from an early stage company. Absolutely. Um, so we've been working with large corporates for the last one and a half years, and based on my experience, um, you know, working with large companies versus working with small enterprises, SMEs, is, is very different, a challenge. Um, so when it comes to large corporates, obviously the sales cycles are longer, the hierarchies are multiple, so we need to figure out where do you find the right business person who can you know, sort of act as a catalyst and, and um, you bring your technology to reality. So the three key things that I feel uh, we look for when we engage with a startup or with a corporate are, firstly, is the business owner, the pain point owner, the one driving um, the trial or the, you know, the engagement that we have with the corporate. Um, yes, most corporates today have, you know, innovation teams and digitization teams, but it takes much longer to get traction with such departments um, rather than if we go directly to a business owner or if that business owner is someone who's involved in the engagement that we have. So that's the first thing. 
The second thing is that, um, of course, trials make sense because it shows and proves value of the technology before it's completely commercialized, um, especially when a corporate is trying to engage with a startup. Of course, it's a risk from their side. So a trial completely makes sense, and that's what we try to pursue. But what we ask for is that the corporate proves its commitment by putting something on the table. It could be a nominal, hey. could be a nominal sum. Um, and Steve and I always have this discussion about how, what is the right value of that. Um, but you know, with that, just doing it for free, uh, which we have done for one customer, doesn't really make sense, both from the corporate perspective or from the startup perspective. I mean, we're putting in our resources, our time and effort, but the corporate also needs to believe in the technology and not just for the sake of innovation run a trial. So that's where we feel that the commitment has to be on the table in, in monetary terms. And then the third thing, which is very critical for these trials, is there needs to be an end goal to it. So it just does not need to be for the sake of you know, hitting a KPI of, yes, we're working with startups, and yes, we're you know, in, the, in the journey of digitization or innovation, and we're doing all these things, and for PR, because then you know, startups can easily die if they start just doing all these trials which don't lead to something. So there needs to be key success met metrics that we agree on with corporates before the trial. And if we hit them, what happens next? You know, how is that technology going to be operationalized into the business? And that's critical for us. So those are the three things based on my experience that we look as the right partner to work with. So, Steen, I'm going to come back to you in just a second, Freddie, but Steen, one of the things that Nidhi just talked about and you mentioned a moment ago, this idea of co-creation, and I hear that term a lot, and candidly, I'm cynical. Maybe it's because I've worked in, in both corporations and with lots of entrepreneurs, and I would love, we would love, to see corporates that truly did want to embrace this term of co-creation. What we often see is corporations that come in and, and essentially it's procurement in a different form. You know, how many customers, how much this, you know, da 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 da, versus the opportunity to shape and to have an influence based on the experiences that you've had with different big firms and with uh, innovation. Is there an appetite in the maritime industry? I know it's a sort of broad, but you know, maybe within some companies to truly co create and build some things together? Or where is, where, where is the thinking within the big corporates? I think had you asked me a year ago, I would have probably been even more skeptic than you, you say you are now. I would say absolutely there's appetite. And, and, and absolutely there's evidence of that appetite. There is a lot of co-creation taking place right now. The, the short example I gave with the additive manufacturing is, is one such. Uh, it, it's not possible for a singular company to go out and say, I, I would like 10 different items that today are forged to be printed and then get success with that. We need to bring companies that are purchasing uh, together in order to create this. We need to bring them together so that the classification societies that have to actually approve this new way of creating an element that goes into a piece of machinery and, and gets, uh, gets knocked about on the ocean is actually uh, living up to the same standards as the standards the, the naval architects have approved in the past and so on and so forth. So we need the mass and, and in this particular project we have uh, three significant leading entities through NAMIC, MPA and SSA coming together and SSA has made available ten members who all are very, very enthusiastic about this. It's early days. We started only about a month ago, uh, but, but the whole program in this is clearly one where there's traction. Maybe at a, at a somewhat bigger scale, um, and, and this is more ambitious than it is proven yet, uh, we are working on, on sort of the, the mother of all co-creations, really, and, it, and it, I, I preface we are working on it, so we're not quite there yet. Um, the ambassador mentioned that we that that in many ways regulatory uh, impositions help us. Um, they they give give us at, at times a kick up the backside, and we need to react to them. Uh, and this whole demand on initially uh, reduction of sulfur emissions and and subsequently uh, the really big 
one, uh, the, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So IMO has promulgated that by 2050, we need compared to 2008 to half our greenhouse gas emissions on ships. And it has done so very much recognizing that technologies do not exist today that will get us there. So that's really interesting. That, that's worth working on. Uh, so we are a consortium a, uh, anchored around rainmaking that are seeking to launch a decarbonization uh, enterprise here in Singapore. Um, MPA and, and Canada are very much obviously supporting and, and behind this whole thought. Uh, and that takes co-creation. Um, so we are out speaking to all the major corporates uh, that either are cargo owners, uh, and interestingly, they can be very interested in this because it, it ties into their green footprint. So this could be, uh, you imagine, an IKEA that might have a, an opinion about uh, the, the greenhouse gas or the CO2 component of the chair they have moved from point of, uh, of manufacture to point of sales that actually might want to be part of something like this. Um, and, and the whole idea here is we will go out to probably something like 500 startup companies that are completely industry agnostic. They don't have to have a proven track record when it comes to the maritime world. And we will invite them in to have a stab at the problem statements that this quite big pool of interested um, venture part partners will 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 make, um, and then we'll take it from there. Then obviously we'll whittle down the 500 to a, a more manageable number that can prove that they actually have something to contribute with. But I'm sure we'll have rocket scientists and we'll have um, people who have been working on electrification of cars or the wind energy or something completely unrelated to shipping because that's what we need in order to actually find these gold nuggets of bridging where we are today and where we need to be in greenhouse gas emissions in, in 2050. So, uh, you know, invite me back in a year and, and then and let's see how far we have come with that. But yeah, we are super ambitious. And, and if any of you want to be part of this, then um, come and chat with me afterwards. Uh, we're, we're looking for bright minds. Cool. Uh, Freddie, one of the points that the ambassador made and Steen just touched on also is a variety of industries with a variety of technologies and a variety of experiences trying to bring those different capabilities to bear. How does a platform like yours enable uh, that sort of uh, agnostic and, and uh, heterogeneous type of, of sharing? And is that something that you think leads, meaning a platform like yours will be more important in the future as a source of creativity and innovation as, a, as opposed to a source of sort of solving near-term identified problems. I like that one. I like uh, the word enablement, um, and it's also related to what you talked about. It's, it's not enough to get a good idea. It's not enough to be innovative. Uh, it is very important that we are able to execute and get the things implemented. I started another platform 20 years ago, uh, ShipSurf, or co-founder of ShipSurf. It's a transaction platform in the maritime business with a turnover about f 5 billion US dollar today. We had about 30 competitors at that time when we started up, maybe even more. They all had more money than we had, and better ideas, I think, and uh, much higher uh, level ideas. But we were the only ones surviving, and it was only because of the execution. So, as you mentioned, it is extremely important to get things to work. It's important to use the technology, the innovation, explain it to people, but very short after, they have to see what's in it for me. If they can't see what's in it for me, you cannot get it implemented, and specifically not in our world. Uh, the maritime business is quite conservative. It's changing a, a lot these days. That's good. But it is extremely important uh, about getting people uh, or companies or people wor to work working together is of course another key, and I think uh, Kenneth, uh, you and your team has been very good uh, uh, to uh, talk about execution implementation while also talking about innovation, right? To have this support from the governments to get things implemented, 
Uh, that's of course money uh, and a lot of other help uh, we, we, can, we can get. But it is really uh, specifically in the maritime business, it's a huge network. You need, uh, in my company now, I think we have about already 10 real partners and more coming in. And it is uh, the fact that we can work together with other companies which uh, is the key in this implementation uh, process. Yeah. I'm sorry, Jen. One of the things that I want to try and come back to because it's a, a question here and I think it's a question that I'm going to just make as a general open statement instead of pointing to anyone. Uh, but one of the questions which has had a lot of uh, upvotes, can we be specific on the top three problems or challenges that the maritime industry is, is working hard to solve? Right? So if we can just sort of think of them, I'm slightly paraphrasing, but this idea of if we could sort of say these are the three things that are breaking the back of the industry or if we solve them, we'd have a much, uh, much better position because it feels like there's some questions around this concept of can we really distill it to three? I have one word I would come with and I will let the other ones come in with the other two maybe. We are in a, in a business, and this is on the chartering side, it is on the operation side, where we have been used to many years not to have transparency. It is so that in uh, our world, I think it's the only business left in the world where if you ask a supplier what is the price for this product, I don't tell you, he said, no. You have to send me a, a request for quotation and I send you a quote. And if I go in on Lazada today and want to see a Bang & Olufsen a loudspeaker, I can see the price straight away. And I can see the competitor just beside having a better price. And maybe it's another, uh, an original or better, rare, right quality. But to show uh, the quality and the price in the, on the charring side and on the ship supply side, uh, this we have to uh, get up to the surface. And you, uh, people can laugh, oh, it's there today. No, it's not. It's all uh, hidden and we need to open up so we can see prices, qualities, services available just here. So transparency is key to get this open in our business. Uh, I have the problems every day. When I say to a, a ship chandler, can you put you just put your products here, all people can go in and see what you can sell and what quality, they, where you can deliver. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, I can't. Then my competitor can see my prices. But don't you want to compete openly? No, 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 no. Not in this business here. So this is one thing I need. We, we, we need to work on. It's change management and it's implementation again. So yeah? I'm forced to ask the follow-on question. At least it's my own intellectual question, so it's not from the audience. But I'm left when I hear that, I'm left with two or three conclusions. One, and I'm sensitive, so I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just one is. Uh, collaboration, which is I don't discuss price because I protect price. Uh, number two is I don't know. I don't have enough information to honestly sort of describe it in a meaningful way. And Nidhi, I know you're working on this concept that in many cases customers aren't necessarily knowing enough or it's done very manually and, and so on. So maybe what I'm going to do is take what Freddie just said and bridge into you in terms of portcast, how are you thinking of this idea of information quickly, readily, accurately, in order to improve the business, by the way, but does it also go into what Freddie's discussing in terms of transparency, or does, or does that stop only at the edge of the company itself? Um, I I, I like to think from a customer perspective, you know, like um, if we look at the entire logistics value chain, um, large companies like just for namesake, a PNG or an Amazon um, could go to shipping companies um, directly because they had the volumes. Um, the smaller companies had to go to a forwarder um, to sort of move their products, and the forwarder could get the volume sufficiently to go to a shipping company. Things are rapidly changing. Um, you know, uh, the entire sort of 
process of, of moving cargo is, is going to be digitized. If you just reflect on what happened in the airlines industry, in passenger airlines, instead of going to an agent, we can now just book online directly with, a, with an airline or through an Expedia. And that's sort of the kind of changes that are happening in the, uh, in the maritime space as well. So more and more, if customers start going directly to shipping companies, shipping companies need to be ready for that. What that means is that they need to have the right efficient structures to take that booking, uh, to move the cargo, to provide transparency, and to be efficient in doing all of this and still make money and be profitable. And that's where I think um, they need to start thinking about you know, transparency and digitization, how, um, how data can, can help in that as well. And that's where podcast comes in. So we're trying to help them understand how cargo is going to be moving, what kind of demand will they have, how do they match it with the supply, and how they can dynamically price um, every single container. And look at every single container almost like a ship in terms of profitability and yield management. Um, and it really comes down to what's happening with the customer. So what is the customer expecting? Um, so that, that's sort of what, how I like to look at an industry structure. So does that transparency, so Steen, I, I, you're wanting to say something here. Let me give you a question also that perhaps links, because there could be one of two outcomes. Transparency creates competition which drives down prices for the end user. Maybe that's good, which means I get more activity. The question is, if we follow this sort of Amazon effect, there's also the other outcome, which is lots of small mom and pop shops get sort of overwhelmed in the process because they can't match that ever decreasing price spiral. So more information, more transparency, more competition, ultimately good for the industry at large, or does it just create a lot of economic havoc in the meanwhile as it forces out some some players so net positive or net net what um, net positive for sure but it has to be put to use where it makes a difference and i think your your original question was what are the big ticket items that this industry is is grappling with um, and not all of those can be solved purely via digital transparency. But some of them absolutely must have digital transparency to move forward. But I think in, I, I want to come back to sort of listing what I think are the three real key ones, because we can spend a lot of time working on a lot of little stuff that, that might save a company a million here or, 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 or gain a company a million in income there, but it's not going to shift the needle really. Um, so I think this, the starting point really is traditionally, if any of you have the ambition to become ship owners, continue with your education, carry on, become smarter, and realize this is not a good idea. <laughs> Historically, ship owners don't make a whole ton of money. Yeah, you see those driving the big cars and living in the fancy houses. They've had one good year, and they've so somehow managed to be really clever to, to set aside the profits they've made from, from that. But over a long period of time, this is not good business to be in for, as, a, for, as a starting point. And that's a problem, because that then gives you this myopia. You become introvert. You, you protect your own assets and look at the business almost purely as an asset-based based business rather than an opportunity business you can digitalize and maybe turn into different businesses than what it is today. So that explains sort of one of the almost anchor reasons why it is difficult to co-create. It's difficult to put two ship owners in a room and go, hey, we got a big problem. Let's work on it together. Problem number two and number, th number three are really the ones that I've spoken about already. January 1st next year, all ocean-going vessels have to burn a type of fuel that has a significantly lower um, sulfur contents, and it will cost the industry a ridiculous amount of money to comply. Now, there is no point in, in debating this. It, it's, it's been decided. It's coming around. We're three quarters of a year uh, in, in, in front of that, that starting line. And I think the latest numbers I looked at was something like $32, $34 billion expected additional cost to the industry. So there's your big problem. This, this is, again, why we're looking in rainmaking at we've got to get at this. 
And the second one that then comes out there is 2050, that then it's greenhouse gas we're looking at. And I, I'm not even aware whether anybody has tried to put a, a cost ticket at that because it, it's not possible to do that as yet, but I'm sure it would be significantly larger than the one I just spoke about. So this is where it's, it's topics like this, I think it's paramount that we throw our resources at more than it is uh, about small cost savings or you know, li little process management uh, issues that, that might be nice, it might feel nice to do something about, but it, it will not change the fundamental of the industry. And, and we need that in order, again, for the ship operators, ship owners to make a profit. So if I were to, sorry, Ken, I'll come right, but if I were to try and take that question a bit, the idea of how can we improve process X or process Y or have these, for the entrepreneurs that want to think about this, trying to get after this injury, industry, you're saying it's a great time because the mindset is much more open to working on innovation, to being more open, but the pressures on the business are also creating the counterbalancing effect, which is if I can gain any advantage, I surely want to try and protect that advantage. I, I don't want to share that advantage because I need to be the last person standing. Uh, but this one about almost an unsolvable, not to be too dramatic, but if it's 32 billion, I don't know what the combined, you know, profitability of all the shipping companies is. But far, is that far from that? <laughs> yeah. So meaning that it, essentially the the capex facing the industry is greater than the profit the industry is generating, which you would say, as a general statement, means you have an unsustainable economic model and there has to be carnage, right? It has to be massive consolidation or massive fines as people live in permanent breach of regulations because it's cheaper to pay the fine than it is to try and absorb the capex without going to too many places. How do you want to think about this right. issue, Kenneth? Well, because uh, you're, you're in the, also helping think through the policy and the, yeah. the structure of the That's industry. Right. So maybe, you know, at one time uh, we had this uh, online discussion. We say that actually there are different maritime hub that is talking about uh, innovation. And I was very curious to find out in different parts of the world, what kind of challenge statements are people pursuing? Maybe, you know, in Europe, what would be the type of uh, challenge statements in this part of the world, maybe in other parts of the world? And, and I think for Singapore, if you look at it, uh, it's a transshipment hub. It is a bunkering hub, right? It is the fifth largest uh, registry. Uh, so actually, you will find that a lot of bunkering uh, challenge statements come out last year in the Smart Port Challenge. Why? Because there is a lot of uh, bunkering activity happening in Singapore. So I think the, 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 for the audience here, for the, the startup companies who are looking at starting from Singapore, that's where maybe uh, understanding of the marine time Singapore, what kind of uh, business we are doing here in terms of transshipment, bunkering, uh, okay. So this, this, all these will point to three areas. I was keep thinking about what are the three areas that, you know, if I were to to pitch, uh, I think one will be uh, obstack integration, right? That will be related to autonomous vessels. That will be related to all the putting sensors on vessels, putting measuring the uh, fuel consumption. You know, because a lot of vessel in the ocean going they need to now pipe back to the ship management company to look at the routes, the fuel and all that. So if you are good at sensors, you are good at data integration, analytics, machine learning, in ops tech, that is one big area. Then you have another big area, which is collaboration, which is you know your supply chain type of collaboration, right? Your bill of lading, how do you integrate all the supplier, buyer? These are all the collaboration platform technology. If you have such a capability, I think that is one big area of collaboration, right? Uh, in collaboration uh, technology. The other one, which is uh, another big area, is really the optimization and predictive uh, optimization type of uh, capabilities that we need. Because there are a lot of optimization problems. The port will say, I have, I have limited uh, berth, there are vessels coming, how do I optimize? And 
if they have a vessels coming in, how do I orchestrate from uh, ship supply to bunkering to garbage collection to crew change to cargo loading? This is an optimization problem. And whether this is in port, whether it's tanker, whether it's bulk carrier, uh, whether it's ship channeling, uh, ship supply, these are all about optimization. And so, so I think the, the key point about knowing what Singapore has so that you can do a head start, try it out here, and then scale it to the rest of the world, I think that's where I think knowing where the business are will be important. Uh, autonomous and all that that we talk about, 3D printing. Mm. So I think these are the big three areas uh, that I encourage everyone to think about and if there are. So last week, we just also bring the, the maritime companies together to talk about what are the challenge statements that they will be preparing for this year's Smart Port Challenge. So, you know, and, and we will then publish, and I, I suspect it will be also around these areas of optimization, collaboration, and ops tech. Yeah. I, I, I think, Kenneth, it, I agree with you, uh, Steen, uh, CapEx, there is a lot of heavy investments to do, and there is definitely areas for startup to solve these, these, uh, uh, this cost. And then, of course, we have the OPEX of a ship, which is an average 2.3 million per ship per year, 600,000, that's spare part, 800,000 crew cost, uh, about 300,000 insurances, et cetera. So break down the OPEX, sit as a young guy, understand the economy of a ship owner, and say, where can I attack, right? Because we need to build a sustainable business, that's the OPEX, right? It has to go down. We know that, right? The prices are dropping. And the cost has to increase accordingly, and even more so we can earn money as well. Uh, and then, of course, we have the investments uh, to do. So I think there is a lot of things that startups they can do, but very important that they know where they will attack and what they will get out of that, right? And what, how this is helping a ship owner or a ship manager or, or what it is, yeah? Or the business in general. So I think uh, learn the economy of, of, of a ship, understand the cost, and get started, right? That's important. Uh, there was another thing you mentioned I have forgotten now, so. <laughs> it's okay, all right. What I wanna do is um, it just in the interest of also allowing us to spend some time together and, and chatting informally, I'm gonna keep going with a couple of questions. I do wanna leave time also for just good old fashioned networking. Uh, first of all, before I go on off of Slido, anybody have a burning question on their heart? Yeah. Uh, hello, we, uh, I have a startup where we do uh, a lot of stuff uh, within the maritime industry and what we often see when we get to the point of having a prototype, when we start to, to do real life testing, we meet a whole ton of uh, legislative work like uh, explosion proofing and stuff like that. Now, specifically explosion proofing, I don't think you should lack that requirement, uh, obviously, but do you see this legislation as something that needs to be revised, maybe updated uh, to, to what operations are today for this innovation to start really moving fast in the maritime industry. So, so just to, if we sort of take the question in the largest context, is the regulatory environment helpful, harmful to the innovation you seek to drive? I would say that we, still of a lot of room to improve in that regulation because uh, you know the IMO will come down everyone if you ask you know I want to I want to digitalize crew management and the first question is oh but IMO hasn't had that ruling yet so you know we can't do so, so what is going to happen then hey, well can we do uh, within the national waters right so autonomous vessels Anyone who say on to sail from Singapore to another country, they'll say, oh, IMO hasn't got the ruling, you know, and that will take another few years, right? But we say, what about in the Singapore waters? So that's where five projects on autonomous vessels on, uh, in the Singapore water. And to be told, it is uh, also an opportunity for the regulator to learn because then we will know what are the limitations that we need and we will face, and then we need to sandbox it learn it and then 
as usual, go out to IMO and say, look, this is a demonstration project and these are the things that we need to now put in place. So I, I, I won't deny the fact that sometimes even flying a drone, you know, it's like, wow, it looks like on the land flying a drone is so simple, but going to the sea, then you got the sea state, you know, the, the, the drones can't land on the, on the sea state and all that, and all the CAS and uh, coordination that we need to make. Yeah, I think that is, uh, and that is why I think uh, we need, all need to work hand in hand, right? We need to have that. Uh, so we set up the Innovation Lab just to make sure that we all can sit down, pull the right people and say, look, we need to have this space, this encouraged space, and how do we work it out and uh, the timing of the trial. Yeah. So it sounds like you have a, an advocate in Kenneth and the MPA, and I hope along the same line as MAS, which really tried to change its position from one of conservatism to one of we better lead or we'll be affected by what everybody else does. So it sounds like Singapore wants to also do that. How does it happen in Denmark in terms of, is, is Denmark a, a leader in the sense of already a giant voice uh, in the maritime industry, as the ambassador uh, well said. So, it, it, so that giant voice can be very influential in terms of pulling people together or pushing people forward. Uh, how does Denmark think of this issue of regulatory environment and some of the questions that the entrepreneur just asked? Is that you, Stan? One, one uh, of the two uh, gentlemen from Denmark, yeah. I, either or. <laughs> I can tell you that, yeah. Huh? No, I have never joined. Oh, yeah. ambassador, even better, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thanks. Uh, I think Denmark has a very different approach to um, innovation than Singapore has. I don't think one of them is better than the other, but I think it's a different approach. In Denmark, we're very industry-driven. It's very much up to industry to create the uh, ecosystems and the framework conditions necessary in order to have an innovative solution. So, for instance, uh, Pier 47 in Denmark is set up by industry. It's set up uh, by rainmaking. It has support of some foundations. The Danish government uh, promotes them, but it is uh, basically an industry initiative, which we think is a kind of a, a testing and uh, an asset test to make sure that it works in the real world and not just in the mind of bureaucrats. In Singapore, you have very clever bureaucrats maybe better than us. <laughs> so here, uh, you, they dare take the risk and say that bureaucrats are able to create these uh, framework conditions and, and set the agenda. And they have done so very successfully uh, in the past, and I'm sure uh, what you're doing now is also going to be successful, but it's a very uh, different approach. In Pier 47 in Denmark, we have um, a maritime ecosystem, but we also have companies from other industries. The idea is that they will cross-fertilize each other. So you have logistic companies, you have um, digital companies, you have banks and others who sit in the same space and think about issues from different angles. Whereas here in Singapore, Pier 71 is very much an industry uh, uh, vertical. It's a maritime space and it's maritime innovation that is happening there. And you know, there are benefits to both, but, but ours is just a, a different approach. But when it comes to creating, enabling, um, framework conditions from the government side, we focus very much on removing regulation and making things possible rather than creating uh, regulation. So we always do a sweep of our neighbors and of Singapore as well to see what is possible here. We have to make sure that at least the same amount of things are possible in Denmark. So that's how we do it. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador. What I'm going to do is uh, Give us another two, three minutes, and then I'm going to go to networking. So is there, instead of me going to Slido, any other question from anybody in the audience? Brief, because I'm going to try and go through two or three, please. Thank you very much. You see, the question is that uh, both Stephen and Freddie uh, and Excellency, the ambassadors, I ask. Merseline at the PSC conference every year. And for the past five years, I was asking for the green LNG. The chief of bunker doesn't know what is LNG. You imagine that? So for, for the past 20 years, I've been asking for green LNG and never come by. When you talk about collaboration, when you talk about you know, partnership, it doesn't exist because you know, division manager don't care about it. So how really you, you think that you're going to go 
pursuit for excellence, pursuit for innovation, you know, the, 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 the what do you call it, the, so I, I really don't know. But you see, Steve, when you say that, you know, that ship owners don't make money, I handle my partner is the second biggest, and you know, the Tongkang King in the 60s and the 50s. So it's not really. I handle PIL, Pacific International Line, in the 60s, 70s, they are all billion, millionaires. So it's not really, it depends on cycle. At that time, real estate is not in. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, so I, really, I really am looking forward because you know why, um, you know, even the PSA, you know, they're very, very backward in terms of forward planning and whatever not. Even when Yong Ning Hong was there, I was asking him, now, that was saying Okay, okay. So we'll take this, we'll take this more as a passionate statement. There was a question uh, from you, please. Uh, uh, do we have a microphone? Yeah, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'll, come, I'll come to you next. Huh? I'll come to you. I, I can be allowed. Okay, one second. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So if I can paraphrase, because I just want to try and get through a couple of other questions, so forgive me. But if the idea is without government mandating something, in fact, the pressure of profitability and near-term competitiveness sort of makes other higher ambitions like environmental friendliness go away. So does government have to just come down on these and you're either meeting the expectation or you're not, uh, because without government intervention, some of these near-term pressures. So we've talked about environmental, but there may be other examples. I think it's sort of almost a, either a philosophical or political discussion, which can take a long time, because it, we can become very passionate about this, I think. But it, it's not necessary any longer. If you look at all the, the ship operators and the asset owners that are out there today, they get it. They, they know what is expected of them, and they're taking a tremendous amount of initiatives, uh, certainly also including the, the use of LNG, uh, certainly also including uh, electrification of the fleet that can be electrified, so we will have battery-driven uh, ships going forward, and, and already have that, in fact, uh, and uh, certainly also uh, exploring the use of uh, hydrogen as a as a fuel and certainly also looking at what can be done with biofuels and already purchasing biofuels and, and putting them into engines and seeing how they, they react. So it, it's not like as if industry wouldn't want to move ahead if it wasn't already promulgated by law. There are many, many examples where no law is in place and, and the uh, industry is, is already uh, experimenting greatly and will continue to do that. Uh, I, I think you're right. In some aspects, we, we need the pressure fr from the government. But it's very smart if we can find areas where we both have an environmental uh, influence uh, and then also a cost-driven uh, effect, right? So there is many areas where the development will lower the cost and make the business more green. Right? If we can reduce the fuel consumption, then it will be lower cost for, for, for the owners and the charter, charters, and we will have a, a lower emission. And there is a lot of areas where we can find uh, such things via technology. And I think we should do that even more. If we optimize our logistics, if we uh, understand to manage the containers better, if we understand not to fly spare parts around the world all the time from China to Europe and back to China again, then we will definitely uh, save the environment and we will reduce cost. So it's about finding these areas. So the OPEX of a ship 
uh, in 10 years from now will be half of what it is today and much more uh, uh, green. And that is possi possible as well. Yeah. Okay, there was a question, yeah. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks, my name is Jeffrey from Innovation Norway. I think, uh, thanks for a very interesting discussion. Uh, just to share a little bit about that. I actually started my career in working for Merce Line. So those days, I think, uh, as I know, when you are a graduate uh, in Denmark, everybody aspires to join Merce Line. The top get to get to join. So in Norway, uh, it's a bit different. The, 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 the motivation to innovate is already there. So they, they have, we have about 50,000 companies uh, every year trying to do something to improve the environment, to improve efficiency, improve cost. In Singapore, we are very much driven by the government. Government had a mandate, they invest a lot. So I had a friend in Silicon Valley, they are not talking about uh, digitalization anymore. This is old, old word already. They're talking about transformation. Now my, my challenge is, uh, is, is that uh, I would like to ask the panel, the most important, I feel, is the mindset. The government can give grants, the company can innovate, or some companies take the initiative. You can do a lot of things, but how do we actually be able to influence the changing mindset? Because if you have the right mindset, I think a lot of things can be improved, can be done. So this is um, a statement. So uh, the industry is behind, so we hope that uh, we can influence the ship owners, the ecosystem, to have a good, positive mindset. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so what I'm going to do is, any other, uh, any other questions from the audience? All right, I've got one or two, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to play this little game called, please answer in as few words as possible. And please ask in as few words as possible, because I'd like to try and give everybody an opportunity to get their question out, but what I can't do is uh, afford the preamble, because I do want to leave time for us. So, go. All right. Uh, my question is regards to innovation. Um, I deal a lot with transferring talent between Denmark and Singapore, uh, being from a Danish company and being Danish myself. Um, although the candidates that I deal with are usually in a leadership position, specialists, uh, I am really interested in the younger generation, especially when you're talking about the future. Is And Singapore, I've been in Singapore for a long time, you know? I mean, these countries are so similar. But is there an incentive um, between our two countries to create some sort of crucible for the, the young talent to kind of uh, share their, their strengths so that they can really move this specific industry forward. Okay. So some joint innovation crucible. I can crucible. this question down there in very few words, I think. Um, in, in my company, we spend about 80% uh, on change management and implementation and ex execution. So it's all about that. Uh, to think about that, get the idea, and then think about how really to get it implemented in the business that's necessary, in, at least in our business. Okay, crucible. So I, I might take a stab at both of them, uh, again, with a concrete example of something we're doing, uh, and again, it's back to rainmaking. Um, spend some time uh, interacting with corporate shipping companies, specifically in Singapore, saw that maybe a handful were out using um, AI as a, an underpinning uh, technology, if you like, to solve some of their problems, and all of them failed. Um, the coders couldn't speak corporate, the corporates couldn't speak geek, for, for, for want of better words. It just didn't work. They, you know, if, if you've done R&D your whole life and you're being called in for a Friday meeting and to, to, to you get led by KPIs and you need to uh, contribute to a PNL, it, it, it breaks down very quickly. So what we're working towards, um, and we will finalize that very soon, is we are establishing an AI lab, uh, so co-run by IHLs uh, and Rainmaking, where we have hundreds and hundreds of brilliant coders and mathematicians and they're stowed away. They're packed away on, on chiefly, I, I might be a little biased here, but chiefly on government mission. Uh, and corporates don't have access to them. Most corporates I speak to have no idea where to go get a good AI coder. So we want to create a lab where the coders are still 
the competence in AI is still owned by the IHLs. Um, the individuals will still identify themselves as being researchers, but when we have projects that the corporates need, then we bring them out. So, so there will be co-creation on certainly some of the startups that I'm working with that, that straddle Singapore and Denmark because rainmaking is, is one of them and, and there will be others in this space as well. And when we are done, when, when, when we don't need the resource any longer, it's not sitting on the, on the books of the corporate. It goes back to the IHL and feels comfortable still being related to R&D. So I think that's one way of, of solving some of this. Yes. Behind you. There you go. Hi. Uh, my question is more related to the co-creation that you mentioned about earlier. Uh, typically, uh, when you co-create, how do we um, have IP governance over it? Es uh, when you especially talk about multi-party involvement and across several countries, jurisdictions, uh, do you think open source could be a possible alternative to that? Okay. So foreground, background, IP and across multiple jurisdictions and is one way around it to have less proprietary and people are basically using open source. So Nidhi, do you want to talk about how that might affect when you're thinking about what you're building, for example, and just to project onto others how that might work? Um, I think corporates uh, struggle with uh, whether they should build internally or they should buy from, uh, you know, a, sort of an expert company which is sol trying to solve one particular problem. Um, from a start startup perspective, if we are focusing on solving one particular problem, um, we need to own the IP. Um, but, you know, in terms of, in terms of the, the technology that we bring, in terms of the, you know, how we're solving the problem, we need to own the IP um, in order to scale and in order to be successful uh, as, a, as a company. What we can do is talk about how, you know, how the data sharing works and you know, who owns the data and who owns the results and the deliverables of the data. But in terms of the technology and what we do, that needs to be the core component of why you're building a company and then scale from there. So that's my view on IP. I mean, it, 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 investors would struggle, I think, to back an early stage company in which there isn't something defensible, whether it's however we talk about it. But I think the data point is an important one. So when you think about it, so either Kenneth or Steen or Freddie, Nitty's raised the point, data is the real value, frankly. I mean, the algorithms are the algorithms, but the data, the quality of the data, and then what do I learn and what actions can I take? So is there a between Singapore and Denmark, in addition to the physical talent, do we also have an opportunity to talk about data and data sharing and how do we think about this idea of data privacy, data governance? I suppose the uh, maritime industry is a global business. So whether the port doesn't just visit the two port authorities, but they visit all over the world. And therefore, the data to corporates and enterprises are key. But where the port authorities at individual location will help to support is uh, putting the data into an open data platform, like in the Maritime Data Hub that is uh, AIS data and all that. For vessels along the Singapore water, I'm sure in, then, uh, in, uh, in, in, in other places you also have other similar initiatives, so that the, the solution can then work and get the data out from uh, location-based uh, uh, authority and get the data and use it as part of the solution and then scale it out as you go and move to other ports authority. Do you want us to get you a chair, Ambassador, and then you can join the, the panel officially? No, just one comment. When you ask about what is the collaboration between Denmark and Singapore in sharing data, uh, one of the, uh, the things that have come up recently is that we had the Secretary or the Director General from the Danish Maritime Authority out here a couple of weeks ago, and he offered uh, Singapore to be part of a, a development in Denmark where we're making the first digital ship registry. So instead of just uh, each country building their own and these not ending up being compatible, we're offering uh, an opportunity for Singapore to, to onboard this project and, uh, and develop some common standards. So this is not yet data sharing, but at least it's an understanding mm -hmm. that we don't need to make this more difficult than it has to be for, for the companies. One question, and I'll just pose it, and then I will draw it to a close. We've talked about 
sharing of intellectual capital, and we've talked about data, we've talked about regulation, but I'm going to pick up, Steen, on the point that you mentioned earlier about MRO and 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Uh, it's a big deal, and it, it's a physical cost and environmental cost, but where do we think about this idea of harmonizing standards? So if I were to print something, and I'd say this is going to be acceptable in this turbine, in this engine, I, I mean, I'm no expert in this, but I assume, back to this sort of example of wh whoever this mystery IMO, but uh, you know, the idea that who has to say, sure, that's okay, right? I'm happy with that process, I'm happy with that material, and I'm happy to certify that if you print it wherever is one of the approved 25 stations around the world, uh, that's fine. Is that dozens of, of entities or two entities, or how, how does that actually get done? It's, it's about a dozen, and it's a very well-established industry. This is what we have classification societies for. Uh, they are trained in this. They have laboratories where they can do uh, tensile tests and all sorts of other uh, tests on the item itself, and they can also certify the process of how it's done. Um, and in this particular project we are running here in Singapore, uh, DNVGL is uh, a partner in the project. Uh, they have a lab here. They have incredible competence within uh, additive manufacturing and essentially they will keep us sane. So we as industry won't be the ones to decide that we, we just, we have a folly here and we, we pursue that, we'd like something printed. They absolutely have to either certify or, or verify or in, in there's, there's a whole slew of uh, very fixed procedures just like they do today when uh, an item is made in a factory if it's forged or built in, in some way or the other. Freddie, you say something in general about data. Uh, to use data as an individual company can be nice. You can get something out of that. But you need to standardize so we can share the data. If we are not able to share the data, we will not be able to get the most out of the data. And if the data are not standardized, we cannot share the data. So it's the keystone uh, in utilizing data. On Moscord, we hope that we will be uh, the standard within uh, uh, ship supply, uh, so people, they can share uh, their demand across uh, departments, across uh, companies, and start aggregating and whatever they want to do with the data. So standardization is even the key, the keystone in utilizing data. I met with a very big production company here some weeks ago, and I asked them, do you have all your, they spent billions in, in uh, purchasing, or buy for billions, and, and he said, we have all our uh, data standardized across all our departments around the world. And I say, you are, you're a very lucky uh, company. So standardization uh, is key, mm -hmm. simply. Okay, uh, so what I'd like to do is, I'm sure there's other things that we can explore, but let's leave time to also have a chat with each other. So I'll start first uh, by thanking Excellency for the support of uh, Denmark and the Embassy of Denmark and helping us bring this together. So thank you, we treasure that discussion. Uh, thank you for our friends that are helping represent Team Denmark and Nitty, the uh, entrepreneur that's going to be a household name in the years ahead. So please know that you saw Nitty here before she was on the cover of Forbes and Fortune magazine as an entrepreneur, and Kenneth helping drive uh, innovation here within MPA. So thank you everyone for being a part of tonight. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>